So I hit refresh. Oh, I have to look at you, Paolo, for the signal. Okay, greetings, Earthlings. My name is E.R. Cho. I'm a filmmaker and screenwriter in the Department of Visual Arts. So here, refresh. Wait, now I have to mute myself. Oh, I have to Sorry. look at you, Paolo. Sorry, I just got feedback of myself. Um, so on behalf of our department, I turn my YouTube off. I'd like to welcome you to the next special guest lecture in our visual arts graduate speaker series. Um, a talk by scholar, artist, curator, and community arts educator, Jillian Hernandez. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our department chair, Amy Adler, PhD art practice graduate student, Fabiola Carranza for moderating our Q&A. Um, technical support staff, Paolo Zuniga, for guiding us through the Zoom YouTube interface. Um, MFA graduate student, Bailey Davenport for organizing the artist critiques with Jillian. Nick Leslie for communication support and any other faculty, staff or students who have made this event possible. So thank you. So again, our special guest today is Jillian Hernandez. Um, assistant Professor in the Center for Gender, Gender Sexualities and Women's Studies Research at the University of Florida. Her work is inspired by Black and Latinx life and imagination and is invested in challenging how working class bodies, sexualities, and cultural practices are policed through gender tropes of deviancy and respectability. Her work bridges and creates interventions within academic fields of study, including art history, visual culture, critical race and ethnic studies, performance studies, carceral and abolition studies, and feminist gender and sexuality studies. She is the author of the recently published and powerful book, Aesthetics of Excess, The Art and Politics of Black and Latina Embodiment, inspired in part by her work with Women on the Rise, a, pro um, a project and artist collective she founded in Miami, Florida in 2004 that engaged thousands of Black and Latina girls in critical dialogues about identity through feminist art. And recently, uh, Jillian and Women on the Rise collaborated in making art for the marking time at, for marking time at P MoMA PS1 in New York, the exhibition organized by Nicole Fleetwood one of our recent speaker series guests. So as some of you know, through the course of this academic year, the visual arts faculty and graduates, graduate students have co-created a, a year long course to, to take together called The Art of Change. And in the course, they've recently read um, Jillian's essay, Beauty Marks, The Latinx Surfaces of Loving, Becoming and Mourning. It's a moving performative and theoretical text that offers a critical framework and poetic lens to see the relational and embodied possibilities in the body work and femme beauty practices of Latinx women and girls beyond questions of representation. The essay juxtaposes quote, auto-ethnographic prose that conjures the body work of the author's grandmother with analyses of cultural production by Latinx artists such as Instagram artists, Anything for Selenas and, and artist Patricia Sembrano, one of our own MFA graduate students who um, graduated in 2017. Beauty Marks reflects what, I, what inspires me most about Jillian Hernandez's work. It challenges the limited conventional and old, def old fashioned definitions of art, aesthetic and cultural value through a, through a critique of class, race and gender, but also through much joy, celebration and a real connection to people and living. Today, she's giving a lecture um, both on her book, but also her current thinking on race, art, gender and aesthetics 
and it's, it's followed by a Q&A moderated by uh, Fabiola. Please join me in welcoming Jillian Hernandez to UCSD. Welcome. Thank you so much, Cho. It was such a pleasure um, to get to know you in my time at UC San Diego, and I'm just really thrilled to be back um, in this space, albeit virtual, with you and um, to return to UCSD, which is definitely um, was a formative um, place for me um, as a scholar and as a person. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I also want to um, express my gratitude to Nicholas Leslie, Bailey Davenport, um, Pablo Zuniga, um, Amy Adler, and Fabiola Carranza for their labor, um, in addition to other um, folks who I'm sure are putting labor into this event. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, I'll be screen sharing for most of the time. Um, I'm going to be sharing some, um, some from my book, but then some recent um, work with you all. So I'm both excited and frankly, a little bit nervous about it. Um, all right, so. Oh, I wanna try something. Hang on, someone told me about this thing where you share screen and you can like embed yourself in the screen share, which is a trip. So let's try that. And my boyfriend, Bad Bunny, will have to deal. Okay. Um, let's see if I can get this to work. Oh, look at that. Okay, um, please let me know if this works. Um, it does look like it is cutting off the, um, the image. So I might just do it another way. Okay. Um, share. Okay, so the title of my presentation today is From Aesthetics of Excess to High Maintenance. Um, so I'm really excited um, to share work from my recently published book, Aesthetics of Excess with you all today. But I also wanna share some of the new directions my work is taking as a means of opening up a conversation that has become increasingly urgent given the pandemic and the continued waves of racist, anti-trans and misogynist violence on top of the regular old colonial institutional dynamics in the art world and academy. How do we transform normative structures of value, the value of labor, the value of aesthetics, the value of relationships, the value of life? Both my book and more recent thinking approach this question through the work of women of color artists. In my book, I share stories that trace how the aesthetics, bodies, and community arts labor of Black and Latina women and girls become ensnared in art world shaming, exploitation, and displacement. One of these stories takes place in Miami, Florida, and centers around the Museum of Contemporary Art and Institute of Contemporary Art. I like to begin the telling through a, a piece um, by artist Nina Baer um, titled Portrait Mode. And what you're looking at here is an iteration of this series of work um, in which the artist collected clothing from local thrift shops near the Museum of Contemporary Art in North Miami and framed the fabrics as abstract compositions as part of an exhibition there in 2011. The works prominently feature clothing patterned in animal print, a fashion the artist noted was common among the women's section in the thrift stores, thus reflecting the particular style of the city that recirculates among the poor and working class 
Black and Latinx residents of North Miami where the museum resides. Long associated with hyperfeminine working class sexuality and tackiness, leopard and cheetah prints are patterns that have been embraced by women of color porn performers like the legendary Vanessa del Rio, um, in addition to artists like Nicolene Thomas, so uh, marking the body through an aesthetic of excess. Excess is a style which is very much at home in Miami, an epicenter of conspicuous carnal and material overindulgence. In the Miami version of Byers Project, these objects of quotidian dress are recognized as art. Miami is where I have witnessed how the contemporary art world is enmeshed in the body politics and class effects of gentrification. It's also the site where the aesthetics of excess of my own body and those of the young Black and Latina women I work with are both policed and made possible. For example, a lecture series that I organized on Latina women and the body in October of 2012 at the Museum of Contemporary Art in partnership with Florida International University's Women's Study Center was met with opposition by university administrators and high level supporters of the museum who felt that the photograph reproduced in the promotional material was in bad taste and could potentially harm the image of Latinas in the community. The fallout included removal of funding by elite Cuban American donors, suspicions about my academic agenda, and semi-public protests against my own body presentation and comportment by members of the audience. The image was from artist Crystal Pearl Molinari's series of photographs titled Then Again, where she recreates photographs of her mother, who was a model and renowned vedette performer in 1960s Cuba with her own body through images that she captured during visits to the island in 2011 and then again in 2012. Then again is a meditation on time, nation, identity, and the gendered pressures of familial expectations as she quite literally measures herself up against her mother's body. I collaborated with the uh, museum's graphic designer to create the promotional material for the event and selected the Havana Riviera image um, that juxtaposes Mol Molinari's body with that of her mother Sonia Perla Gil wearing one piece bathing suits. The backlash included the white feminist dean at Florida International University, who had formerly directed the Women's Studies Center, um, sending me an email following the display of this poster on campus, stating that it was embarrassing the university and asking why I decided to show an image of a Latina wearing a quote, ill fitting bathing suit citing the visibility of cellulite on Molinari's body as particularly problematic. Two years later, Molinari and I collaborated on a photographic project titled Ill Fitted, inspired by the girdle and body shaping underwear advertisements targeted to women that are ubiquitous in Miami's working class Latinx neighborhoods. Our stiff and affected poses in the piece mimic the images found in faja or girdle um, advertisements that are arranged in a grid composition to generate an echoing pattern. The project pokes fun at the flagrant gender politics of the advertisements, which promise corporeal perfection via butt padding and waist cinching, while also highlighting the odd poetry of their aesthetics. We exhibited the piece at an alternative art venue in, two, in 2014 and gave it the title ill-fitted to play upon the notions of misfit and unacceptability that we were subjected to through the Latina women and the body fallout, in addition to playing with the slang meaning of ill, like cool or dope. Latinas create art with their bodies, even within the most rigid structures, we exceed them. In my book, I examine aesthetics of excess through my lens as a Latina who has shared space with African-American and, Lat and Latina girls um, for over 10 years through the gender specific community work of Women on the Rise. Um, I founded the project in 2004 and remained involved for over a decade um, through 2015 when the program dissolved due to a series of upheavals that I'm gonna get to later. 
Um, I developed Women on the Rise in response to learning about the increasing number of girls committed to the ju juvenile justice system in Florida in the early 2000s. Um, when I researched the kind of educational opportunities available to them while incarcerated, I found that none of their classes provided a space for self-expression in the midst of what was a profoundly um, distressing experience. I learned that the girls were constantly being subjected to various forms of dubiously effective and at times violating state supported group and individual counseling. With that knowledge, I designed Women on the Rise as an intergenerational feminist art practice rather than as a form of art therapy or self work. Um, the goal of this praxis was to generate a space for girls both in detention and at other community sites to engage in creative expression and critical dialogue, practices that they were either socially and institutionally excluded from, like being artists, or believed incapable of being theorists. Women on the Rise workshops were conducted off-site from the museum in the spaces of collaborating nonprofit government and educational institutions. The project consists of workshops that introduce participants to the work of feminist, anti-racist and queer artists. The workshops culminated in the production of artwork by the participants in a range of media that were inspired by the practice of a given artist. So here we're looking at girls creating uh, silhouettes inspired by Anna Mendieta's work. So this is the campus of a summer um, ed academic enrichment program. So whatever space we had to create silhouettes um, we used or the girls would gather materials that they just found around. Um, they would capture images in their neighborhoods through gilded frames when they learned about Lorraine O'Grady's Art Is Project of 1983. Um, when we would talk about Fidile Bias's work, um, they would um, create these iconic sort of headdresses for um, iconic women of color. So our pedagogy um, fostered creative intergenerational and multiracial relationships and genealogies between the working class Black and Latina girls that we work with and the collective of women artists of color who were instructors for the program. Um, by, focusing the, like, by focusing the workshops on the work of other artists, um, we also created a space for the girls to make revelations or to address issues um, that would otherwise make them vulnerable in a group context. And this was really um, very much something that would occur when we would um, engage with the work of Yayoi Kusama. Um, so we would um, talk to the girls about how Kusama's method of obliterating objects by covering their surfaces with polka dots um, provided her with a feeling of control during her hallucinatory episodes. Um, Women on the Rise artists um, would use polka dots and other repetitive patterns to create their own obliterations of objects in Kusama-inspired collages. Um, the resultant abstract works of colorful patterns conceal the girls' feelings, leaving them to decide whether or not to discuss the meaning of their work in our group conversations. Um, several girls would share that they chose to obliterate a troubling fear, experience, or anxiety. So um, Women on the Rise workshops were collaboratively led and developed by, and what you're seeing here is just like a, a, um, a, a segment of us here, um, by artists Anya Wallace, Crystal Pearl Molinari, Monica Lopez de Victoria, Guadalupe Figureas, Nereda Garcia Ferraz, Dinora de Jesus, Rodriguez, myself, and many others that I wish I had the time to name here. Um, teaching artists also would conduct workshops on their own practice. Um, and we would also organize trips for girls to um, visit artist studios or exhibitions around town. Through um, this, you know, over a decade of work, um, I was always struck and disturbed by um, the fact that, you know, it was black girls who were primarily the ones who um, were um, placed in a lot of these institutions, right? When the population of Latino girls in Miami is like considerably larger, um, the racialization of black girls in the minority majority city 
um, situated them in communities that are more heavily policed with increased state and nonprofit intervention in the lives of re residents. Thus, I learned firsthand how an ethnically and racially diverse context can nevertheless replicate the anti-Blackness that is also found in more homogenous cities in the US. This is the backdrop against which uh, Miami has positioned itself as an epicenter of the contemporary art market, marked by the burgeoning establishment of museums, galleries, and private collections in the late 1990s and early 2000s, and the hosting of the first Art Basel Miami Beach um, Blue Chip Art Fair in 2002. As an international art fair originating in Basel, Switzerland, Art Basel has brought the global art market to Miami, prompting local artists to display themselves for its commanding gaze. Art Basel Miami Beach has generated considerable tourism and attracted a host of satellite art fairs to the city, but it's failed to establish a cultural life that is sustaining for many artists, um, many local artists after the annual week long extravaganza is over. The New York Times published a story about the unfulfilled promise of Art Basel for Miami, such as the closure of influential galleries, um, which has prompted many artists to move. Local artists have cited a lack of collectors and an overall dearth of substantial support for the arts as informing their decision to relocate. And many of these artists are um, folks like Kern and Boss, for example, who sort of laid the groundwork for Miami to, um, to be recognized as a place that, that was important to the contemporary art world. Um, it was also the labor of local artists that transformed poor and marginalized areas of the city, such as Wynwood, into popular cultural hubs. And so um, this is just a, an image of like an American Airlines magazine. I was actually flying to Illinois to give a talk on art and displacement. And lo and behold, um, in this American, you know, uh, airlines magazine, there was a whole story about Wynwood and how it went from no go zone to must see destination, right? So it was, you know, yeah. So um, by embracing graffiti and street art through sponsored projects, uh, Wynwood became a destination for Locals and tourists that eventually turned toward a focus on consumption, such as high-end restaurants and shops that eventually raised the value of the real estate, making it unaffordable for the artists and galleries who have established themselves there. Um, in culture class, um, culture class, um, artist Martha Rosler notes, quote, although artists, flexible service workers, and creatives more generally may not be the source of capital accumulation. It is inarguable that the rising value of the built environment depends on their pacification of the city. While the severing of relations to class history, even of one's own family in many instances, has produced at best a blindness and at worst an objectively antagonistic relationship to the actual character of urban traditions of life and struggle, end quote. The manner in which artists have been called upon to imbue value into poor and working class spaces has resulted in their possible alienation from the communities they come from, in addition to that of local residents. So I recall uh, Women on the Rise artists commenting with surprise at the sudden popularity of Wynwood, right? So the girls always like tripped out on the fact that all of a sudden Wynwood was like a place to go um, when, you know, for them, um, it was a place that people would avoid, right? Due to public safety concerns. Um, these girls lived close to the area and were shocked that it was graffiti of all things um, that created the surge of interest and investment, right? In their experience, graffiti signals the urban class struggle that Rosler mentions and largely results in policing and punishment, not upward mobility or international recognition. Um, thus, what cultural studies scholar Dick Hebdige identified in the late 1970s as graffiti's power to disfigure social norms has become a key tool of sanctioned and sanitized urban remodeling. It was clear to me in these conversations that the girls did not feel that they were a part of what was happening in Wynwood, despite their proximity to and familiarity with the area. Um, so, you know, these politics, like, I'm not. 
I'm not sharing anything new. I'm not sharing anything that you all don't know. I'm not sharing anything that like, as much as I bemoaned it was like that surprising to me. But um, what did sort of shake me up quite a bit was in 2014, when Women on the Rise itself became a target of art world gentrification. And that's just not something I was prepared for, right? Um, so MOCA, the Museum of Contemporary Art, which was its home base, its home, um, received a significant portion of its operating budget through the city of North Miami. So in a way, it was like a city department, but it was also a 501c3 nonprofit organization that was like governed by a board of directors. Um, the museum received funding from local, state, and national sources, along with foundations, individuals, and corporate entities. Um, in 2010, it launched a capital campaign. Oh, that's more Winwood Trash. Um, and then here's the museum. So in 2010, it launched a capital campaign for a $15 million expansion of the building you're looking at here, which was um, a 3,500 square foot exhibition space. Um, when a proposal was submitted to the voters of the city of North Miami in 2012 to create a bond issue to fund the expansion, it failed to pass. The following year, um, Bonnie Clearwater, the longtime director and chief curator of the museum resigned, likely due to fallout from the vote. In the midst of the power vacuum caused by Clearwater's departure, the MOCA board, upset by the city's failure to fund the building expansion, explored the possibility of relocating the museum from the primarily working class, um, historically Haitian immigrant enclave, enclave of North Miami to the more exclusive locales of South Beach or the design district. The board initially planned to um, move MOCA's permanent collection of 600 artworks in a merger with the Bass Museum of Art in Miami Beach um, but the board abandoned those plans and later sued um, the city of North Miami in order to facilitate the establishment of a new museum that would be housed in Miami's design district. Um, and this is like just a little piece of what the design district looks like. So it's an area sort of replete with um, high end uh, restaurants, high end stores and all of that. So, um, the design district is a small area of the city covering sort of a mere five city blocks. Um, and just like, you know, uh, not too far from here, there are a whole sort of tenement um, dwellings for houseless people, right? Um, but they nevertheless uh, went through with this move to the design district and established a new institution, uh, which I urge you all to boycott, um, called the Institute of um, Contemporary Art in Miami. Um, the MOCA board comprised of wealthy high profile art collectors such as Irma and Norma Brayman um, did not, um, sorry, just Irma Brayman, not Norman Brayman. Um, they did not reflect the majority of the residents of North Miami, right? So these are really uh, rich white folks. Um, in fact, during the seven years I worked at MOCA, I witnessed constant frustration by board members and other high level supporters who felt that North Miami was undeserving of an elite contemporary art institution. Uh, sometimes board members asked for there to be city police on hand during evening board meetings to protect them from potentially criminal residents. Despite the fact that North Miami established a museum and made its operation possible, the board's lawsuit eventually allowed for them to leave with 150 artworks, a quarter of the permanent collection um, to create ICA. Um, ICA opened at this building in the design district, the Moore Building in 2014, and a year following announced that it was going to begin construction of a new building um, that did open in 2017. So the very same board members who bemoaned the North Miami voters refusal to use taxpayer money to, to fund the museum expansion did manage to fund the construction of a brand new building in an exclusive area of the design district, right? Just a year after leaving MOCA. Um, so um, this all occurred in 2014 after I had relocated from Miami to San Diego to take a tenure track job um, at the University of California at UCSD. 
Um, and I learned from staff still at MOCA that part of the board's lawsuit included not only the 150 permanent collection artworks, but MOCA programs, including Women on the Rise, which the museum copyrighted very pettily in, 20, in 2007 after I went to grad school. So when I went to grad school, MOCA copyright, <laughs> copyright, the, like so many levels, y'all. Okay, anyway. So um, upon learning of the board's intentions, my Women on the Rise colleague, Anya Wallace and I launched a letter writing campaign to our collaborators to alert them of, you know, this um, desire of the board to take women on the rise. Um, and, you know, it was effective, but at the end of the day, it was bittersweet because although women on the rise was sort of officially dropped from the lawsuit, they're just doing a pink wash version of it with a different name, right? Like, whatever um so you know one of the most difficult aspects of this was learning that some women on the rise instructors were colluding in the attempt to take women on the rise to ica which caused serious damage to our relationships um some instructors felt betrayal and disbelief um feeling that the social justice vision of the project required that it stay in north miami and others felt that moving the project to ica would ensure its future as it would have a funding stable source, you know, so holding these two positions. Um, when I eventually visited MOCA after all the legal dust had settled, it was like a ghost town. The board had taken all of the books and DVDs used for women on the rise, along with computer equipment, art supplies, and cameras to ICA. There was a bare bones staff at MOCA struggling to apply for funding as the board also succeeded in transferring many grants to the new institution. Um, and the media and art news about the board departure tended to vilify the city as an ineffective bureaucracy that failed to respond to the museum's needs and applaud the board members' decision to take their cultural capital elsewhere. So um, in response to the silence regarding the politics of the board departure, um, the new MOCA um, director, Baba Karambao, um, published an anthology in 2014, and there was a new show. Um, and the anthology was called Mocha Reclaiming Art, Power, Ideas, and Vision in an Ethnically Plural Community. Um, and it included critical analysis of the former, birds, the former board's actions and art criticism by academics of color like Carol Boyce Davies and Satya P. Mohanty. Um, the anthology is interspersed with images of people of color exploring MOCA galleries, highlighting the new mission and audience of the museum on the occasion of its first post-board departure show, Third Space, Inventing the Possible, that was on view from September through November of 2014. The exhibition and accompanying, accompanying anthology propose a new vision for MOCA, quote, no longer the elitist center for the exclusivity of the few. It no longer appears in opposition to popular culture. It represents the continuity and exceeding of expectations regarding our human condition. End quote, that was from, from Baba Karambao. <clears throat> and this was a really exciting vision, you know, um, but sadly it was not followed by institutional success uh, Mbao was alienated by the cultural community in Miami due to his open criticism of the departing board. And he faced um, considerable challenges in securing funding for the museum. Major MOCA supporters like the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation um, apparently transferred their funds to ICA, uh, revealing the sort of inner, inner circle politics of wealthy donors and foundations, right? Uh, MOCA staff who left to work at ICA failed to submit final and interim reports for grants, right, thus making it so that like MOCA then like was ineligible to then like apply for grants the following year. And in 2016, Umbel was fired from the museum amid accusations of sexual harassment. Um, so um you know it I, I mean me and me and my friends like always say like something about it is cursed like something about this museum like we actually did like a little ritual um around it and like it didn't work apparently because it's still like a total disaster but anyways so in 2014 um Umbao wrote to quote him again 
quote, it was grossly unfair that a small city which had been spending a million and a half dollars a year to support a board that never cared for its citizens was faced with the dismantling of its most important future asset. The myopic vision of a certain privileged class, the senselessness of the intense and inexorable damage to the institution and the former board's enigmatic refusal to be held accountable all raise the uncomfortable suspicion that perhaps after all, the art world has no genuine order. And I sit with that, right? I sit with that still. As Mbao noted, um, the upheaval at MOCA revealed the failure and true class character of the mainstream art world, the nonprofit industrial complex, and of neoliberal capitalism as emphasis on ownership and this like narrative of ineffective government, right? Um, led the board to pillage the museum as in, you know, colonial con as a colonial sort of project, right? Um, as all along, they did not feel that it belonged to the public. Um, and since the board departure, um, you know, Women on the Rights has just not been able to recover and serve girls in the same way. Anya, one of um, Anya Wallace uh, from our collective and I, we would come in the summers and try to, to work with girls and we did, but, um, you know, being away, there was only so much we could do and we were both sort of in other ways pushed out of MOCA anyway, right, which was why we weren't, we weren't there. So just like the levels of difficulty in trying to, to undertake this work and, and to negotiate these politics of value is sort of precisely what I started to understand was deeply intertwined with the actual sort of appropriation then of forms of Black and Latina embodiment that then appeared in the work of valuable contemporary art. Um, and just like another little funny thing, um, our logo was gifted to us by the artist Andrea Bowers. And you can see Crystal here like wearing it. And then on top of like, during the whole ICA thing, this like t-shirt company, um started to sell like a ripped off version of our shirt for like 30 bucks it was just like so extra um so that was happening also um but you know even um i i also want to say like this moment in in sort of miami art world history is really important and i i go into more depth in my book about it because other institutions had other things happening that I think are really important to, to historicize and to theorize. Um, but the truth of the matter is that Women on the Rise was always under-resourced and undervalued, even during MOCA's most successful times. Um, the program was given just enough funding to do the work of performing MOCA's reach to the community, um, outreach, which was also touted during appeals to donors, but it was never prioritized when Women on the Rise staff had bigger ideas for its evolution, like there should be residencies, there should be exhibitions in the main gallery of the work that we're doing, right? Um, women on the Rise, like the girls and women who embody aesthetics of excess, was allowed to be visible so long as it stayed in its place. Um, and this is why its dedicated instructors often found themselves having to leave the program for other opportunities. Um, so, um, you know, this is a story of heartbreak, something that Black feminist scholar Ruth Nicole Brown and I have talked about a lot as it relates to our respective work with girls. One way um, that I processed this heartbreak was by turning to my usual MO, getting women of color artists together. Inspired by my rich conversations with women on the rise artists on Nicki Minaj, which I discuss in detail in my book, um, I decided to present a performance and curate an exhibition in Miami during a summer trip in 2014 that would provide a forum back home and outside of the academy to engage in conversations um, similar to those I had with Women on the Rights Girls and my circle of women of color artists and scholar friends. Let's talk about Nicki Minaj, a Rococo sideshow salon was an ephemeral interactive performance project exhibition and happening that took place for one night at the alternative artist run venue Space Mountain in Miami on July 24, 2014. In addition to my performance and installation, let's talk about Nicki Minaj. It featured works by artists Rosemary Romero, Anya Wallace, Kevin Arrow, and Crystal Pearl. 
Rosemary Romero presented her Porn Nails Project, a mobile nail salon that provides free manicures and gossip to clients through choppy camp, choppy camp performances, Latina kitsch, and relational aesthetics. This iterated project involves participants in conversations around gender, class, race, women's work, sexuality, and aesthetic labor. Anya Wallace presented um, an altar-like tableau featuring her series of watercolor paintings that depict abstracted figures of Black church women in elaborate hats and sexual body positions. <clears throat> the series is inspired by her reflections on the embodied erotics of Black women, quote, catching the spirit um, in church as an under-recognized mode of Black feminist freedom in and through spirituality. Kevin Arrow presented a looped video that layered and distorted footage of Nicki Minaj selling her branded merchandise on the Home Shopping Network. Unfortunately, I don't have good images of that. Um, Crystal Pearl Molinati, whose work um, I discussed earlier, exhibited several pieces. One of them is the cover of the book, um, exploring the meaning making around working class Latina body practices. And we also showed the ill-fitted piece in the show. Um, the happening was free, open to the public, and promoted through the social networks of participating artists and Space Mountain. In framing the space as a Rococo sideshow salon, I sought to foster an environment in which feminized body practices and popular culture were taken seriously, but where the vibe was not serious. I worked to achieve a balance between celebration and critical exchange, campy performativity, and the sharing of personal truths. The salon opened up spontaneous conversations with those who attended on issues like gender and sexuality and hip hop and mass culture, um, racial fetishism and authenticity, capitalism and style. For my project, let's talk about Nicki Minaj. I performed the role of a chusma Latina Rococo courtier um, dressed in a wig and an elaborate lacy floral printed gown with a punk aesthetic. I situated myself in an installation with collages that juxtaposed juxtapose image, imagery of Nicki Minaj and Rococo ceramics, hung salon style on a wall adjacent to ornamental mirrors. The space included an, or, an ornate floor lamp and candelabra, as well as a slideshow of Rococo and Minaj imagery projected onto a pink curtain festooned with pink Christmas lights. I created a salon in the installation with cushioned chairs arranged in a semicircle. Posed in a pink floral printed Rococo style armchair, I held court through spontaneous conversations with attendees about Nicki Minaj and whatever other issues regarding representation and embodiment they wanted to discuss. I served visitors slices of a pink frosted cake that read Bees in the Trap, um, which marked the space as one of pleasurable creative labor and invoked the vilified Rococo excess of Marie Antoinette. Um, it was a really fun night. Um, some Women on the Rise um, artists attended, got their nails done and read poetry. Old friends came by and some high school girls who randomly found out about the event on social media sat with me for a long while to talk about their conflicting feelings about the music and performance of Nicki Minaj. It was a party, a femme party in which cis men shared but did not take up space and in which the bodies and aesthetics of Black and Latina women and girls held court. In light of the dust of Breonna Taylor, Toyin Salau, Vanessa Guillen, and Dominique Remy Sells, among too many others, the necessity of artistic, cultural, social, and political praxis towards the valuation of femme of color life, which is inextric inextricably bound to visuality and aesthetic, is beyond urgent. This necropolitical landscape has led me to consider the politics of respectability, institutional power, and girlhood in new ways. These shifts have been inspired by a cadre of artists whose work engages feminine aesthetics, girlhood, and decorative practices to transmogrify given structures of value that legitimize violence and oppression. I'm specifically thinking of artists like Tourmaline, Kenya Robinson, Yvette Mayorga, Pamela Council, Sadie Barnett, and Juliana Huxtable, though there are many others. The practices of these artists had led me down unexpected paths to YouTube gold digging gurus, cake architecture, and playful, dead serious engagements with racialized sexuality, desire, death, and radical iconography. 
Although I'm still developing my theoretical framework, my intuition is guiding me towards a conversation on the world transforming alchemical power of high maintenance as an aesthetic and feminist political praxis. High maintenance can be described as a stance that asserts rather than pleads for the valuation and protection of women of color and other people made vulnerable by what Kenya Robinson calls the ism. It often appears in pink as a confectionary object, a fleshy invocation, and a voluptuous figuration. It, like the abject performances theorized by Leticia Alvarado, does not rely on respectability to confer legibility. To do so would entail alienated labor and high maintenance aesthetics and practice only engages work out of femme of color vision, desire, pleasure, and care. This new thinking goes beyond whatever my ideas about a second book or exhibition project might be, though those are in the works. My arrival at the place of high maintenance comes in part from my own burnout and exploitation and that of the women of color scholars and artists in my life. To explore this field has meant that I start to recognize the alchemical power of gold digging as an extraction of value from heteropatriarchy. It has meant putting city girls on the syllabus. I don't work jobs, bitch, I am a job. It has meant that I demand more money for my labor and work to get more for the artists that I work with. And I wanna show you all um, a video that like really, um, you know, really just affirmed and took me to a different level and how I'm really thinking about the work of high maintenance. And I'm so happy to share it with you. If you haven't seen it already, I'm, I'm blessed to have made um, a friendship with artist Kenya Robinson, who's based here in Gainesville. And she just continues to inspire me in like really, really um, transformative ass ways. So I wanna share some of that brilliance with you all. Um, so I'm gonna share a clip um, from a video that she posted on Instagram. And then um, I have something else I'm gonna show you all too. But let me, um, oh, snap, hang on. Okay. Show is that visible? Okay, so um, this is a video called Don't Be Pussy Whipped, Whip That Pussy, or Pay Me Fuck You. And I'm just gonna play a little bit of this. I'm trying a new approach to um, how I interact with uh, institutions, the outside world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that is, I have generally been convinced that I have to um, prove myself. Like if I get offered an opportunity to um, create something, something that I was going to create anyway, if I get the opportunity to create something, that I have to prove that I'm worthy of the support. And I want you to consider that your ancestors have already paid that price. Just consider it. So in, in, in actuality, they are owed. So instead of, you know, I just got a, um, I was supposed to uh, do a performance or a, I guess kind of a lecture performance um, at a local institution here in Gainesville. And I, I shared my terms, which includes getting paid first. And it took him, you know, about a week or so to respond, maybe even over a week, maybe 10 days to respond. And he said the, 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 the conduit by which I'm having this conversation said that the institution doesn't do it like that. Um, that he's never, experience an artist getting paid before um before the work is completed and in that moment i realized that that is something that 
a space that we can exhibit courage. Um, and so instead of waiting, like I, I've decided that I'm going to demand, not even demand, because that seems actually like too much energy involved in the exchange, but a requirement of our working together is that you have to pay me first. I think so often we think that we're getting paid for the work that we do. But imagine that you're actually getting paid for the work that you've already done. Because remember, the ancestors wasn't paid. They weren't paid for their work. So all you're doing is cashing in on the work that's already been done. And even if you don't want to go that far back into like history, nine times out of 10, nine times out of 10, you've already done the work. The reason why they're even having the conversation with you is that you've probably provided them a service, even in the interaction that is valuable. So just get them to pay you first. So I encourage you to watch this video in its entirety multiple times. Um, but that is the kind of stance that um, I'm trying to identify and practice, right? Um, so the transformation on my life and those of artists working from the place of high maintenance has been astounding and real. We are transforming institutions under the feminist camouflage. Y'all don't even know, but you're about to. Um, I recently organized a roundtable with um, some of the artists that um, and visionaries um, that I'm discussing here. And so I want to just play a few clips from that discussion as a way to just open up a little bit more conversation. Um, so. I oh here we are here we are so let me just I'm just gonna jump around this YouTube video and play you a few clips and then I'll close so um, this was a roundtable conversation um, it's available if we can send folks um, or put this in a description bar for this YouTube video that would be amazing I can send that around later um, this is on my YouTube channel. And this was a conversation with curator Christina in Akimba Boyle, who organized this amazing show at Canada NYC recently called Black Femme, Sovereign of WAP in the Digital Realm, um, and artist Pamela Council, Yvette Mayorga, and Kenya Robinson. And we talked about how, you know, the aesthetics of femininity sort of informs their work, but we kept returning to these questions of value, right? And these questions of high maintenance and there's like a really interesting moment where Pamela Council, um, she's talking about her work, Black Sojourney, which really engages with questions of Black life and, and embodiment and the valuation and devaluation of Blackness. And um, she starts to have this conversation about high, high maintenance in her work. And then Yvette Mayorga follows talking about a series called High Maintenance and none of them knew that this was occurring. And so it was just like a really, it was like a brilliant moment. Um, we're not gonna be at that moment precisely, but I do just wanna share a few, what I think are really important moments from, from this conversation. So um, we will start with um, Pamela Council. Work needs to be taken care of. So I decided fountains would do that for me. So I started working in fountains. This is grape drink and Listerine on top of George Washington's dentures. This is a vision board for Fountain of My Youth, um, which is a bead fountain, thinking a lot about the protective styles we put on little girls. And it's also designed to like spill beads out onto the floor. So it's a little bit of a temper tantrum on the gallery and like telling them like, you gotta take care of this little baby. Um, similarly, Lester's pink lotion becomes a fountain combined with a sex toy, combined with a quilt, and that piece, tender headed, expands into these black sodermy pink works, um, where there's a room filled with the smell of Lester's pink lotion and the sound of these whirring sex toys and goopiness 
and it's shoes off, like get comfortable. For the latest one, I designed these Cal Rochelle protective style rugs. Um, and it's really an offering to my tween knee bopper self. Okay, so um, so girlhood comes up a lot. So now I want to move to another portion of the conversation um, with Yvette Mallorca. Um, so she sort of follows up on this. Your fountains and how, and you, and then you said high maintenance, you know, and 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 asking and whatever, I'm assuming whatever their space they're in, that they are high maintenance and they need to be taken care of by wherever they are in whatever specific space. And I think that's so revolutionary also to take up space and then also to demand to be cared for. Um, I think is something that is also so difficult, like speaking you know, on behalf of myself as a Latinx, a woman identifying person to have that sort of um, confidence in several spaces to demand that. I think that I do it in a way of taking up space visually by taking up and painting the walls pink, the white walls pink. But I love the idea of physically asking the, you know, the viewer, the audience or the caretaker to handle um, with care, but that it is high maintenance. And going back on what, you know, Kenya, what you were mentioning about the blonde hair, like that. Okay, so um, I'm gonna now move to Kenya. We started a conversation on adornment um, and we got back to this question of, of value and care and relationship. And that will be the last little part that I play. Uh, Avril's uh, mention of adornment um, because that's becoming more and more um, a part of my world, you know, because um, I, I was looking at some pictures of me from like, I don't know, the 90s and I was like not taking advantage of all the ways I could have just been stunting on all these things. <laughs> and so now I'm just going to do that. And I'm like, I, so I have my, my Brianna um, necklace because, you know, um, when Sandra Bland was murdered, I just like, I went into a depression because I just saw myself so clearly in the, the way the communication was happening and, um, and it just, it scared me. And I was like, I have to do something else with those kinds of feelings and I'm, I'm my plan is to like get the name plates for every black femme um person who you know just it doesn't have to be today it's a like you know it's a collect like it's a it's some it's a way in which i want to adorn myself to bring that energy into my being as I'm out in the world. And then the other thing that like specifically, um, and I actually got this, um, this insight from another artist, another black femme artist, and um, who is really interested in body modification. And, um, and, you know, I was, I was always afraid to get a nose ring you know, like I kind of had internalized a lot of ideas about, you know, what my nose looked like and all this kind of stuff. And um, I'm so glad, I, you know, what convinced me to get it, she was like, well, you know, that once you start putting jewelry in your face, that means that that's queen shit. Like, cause what else can you do? You know, it's not like you're gonna like be appropriate appropriate you know what I mean and I was like you know it's it's a choice that you make and when she posed it like that it made it so much more um appealing you know um it's something I already wanted to do but I I've taken I've taken like you know and I have a like a little array of of septum rings but like 
I tried to like be like, oh, well, I'll take it out. And it just, I feel naked now, you know, because it's a reminder that I'm off somewhere else. You know, when I, when I get, when me and, when we and Pamela go to wig shopping in New York City, when I come down there, I mean, it's going to be whatever it is. It's going to be something that is going to be like completely out of this world. And I'm going to feel good about it because I don't have to be confined by, like Pamela said, these respectability politics. The, I can take the influences of my very um, religious upbringing and use it for how I want to. I can, you know, adopt Christiana's approach of like, okay, so like not only am I going to like create this platform with my own hands as a person who knows how to code, but then I'm going to go over it a pace and then I'm just going to run that. So like all of that, like, and, and, and Jillian, how she's like, okay, I'm going to get y'all some real money. I ain't going to get y'all some little, I'm going to get y'all some real money. That, that all of that taken together, it's a good, as, as my friend Trent would say, it's a good room. It's a good room for whatever you want to make. So on that note, um, I will um, I will stop. Um, I want to thank you all um, again for the space and engagement, and um, I look forward to some conversation. I hope. Thank you so much, Jillian. That was such an amazing presentation. I'm so completely moved by every stage of. Um, uh, of of your talk, I um, as I mentioned, um, Fabiola Carranza is going to moderate our Q and A, and I'll be uh, looking at the YouTube comments. And so, anybody out there in YouTube watching our our, our um, event, please post your questions on the YouTube, and then I'll just copy and paste them and relay them to Fabiola and Jillian. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Fabiola, did you want to start off with a couple of questions while we wait? Hey, uh, thank you so much, Jillian, and thank you to the department and to Cho for uh, organizing this event. I feel overwhelmed with a lot of emotion right now hearing your lecture because in many ways, this has been a difficult week um, in our department. Mm, um, but also, um, you know, so much of what you're suggesting resonates and it feels like high maintenance is a term that I um, find interesting because it seems genderless. Mm, so bringing, I like bringing, that. I didn't even think about that. Bringing mm -hmm. it to the realm of femme does something, whereas, you know, a negative term to to observe that about a woman in the past would have been like, Strong-minded, stubborn. Uh, oh, definitely or, uh, or, right. Uh, negative woman. Yeah, yeah, you know it would have had. Whereas with high maintenance, I think we'd get somewhere else. I couldn't take the the notion of the television show away from my mind. So, oh, I you know, don't some, even know what's the television show. <laughs> it's an HBO TV show. It started as a sort of online mini series. Uh huh. It's about a pot dealer in New York. He's white. Uh, it was co-written by a man and a woman, and. You know, in, in, I'm in, interested in the way that you relate pop culture with theory and sort of expansive ways to make artwork. I really love this image, so I want to draw attention to it in the text that you wrote. Oh. This is from, <laughs> yeah. um, with the Diane Arb Arbus rejections. And I wonder to what extent you feel comfortable with your research with publicly outing instances where you've encountered resistance uh, whether that be by individuals or institutions to allow you to do the work that is needed and what that effective labor and the 
sort of being denied support has done to you. Uh, Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, I think um, I think I, I've had to operate from a place of having nothing to lose because these institutions never gave me enough to make me not want to out them, you know, like in, in, a, in an honest, I'm just being completely honest, right? Like if you are already undervalued, then you don't have a lot to lose. And I think, I think, you know, when I started, um, when I started Women on the Rise, when I was at MOCA, you know, I was definitely like, such a little like you know <laughs> I it was just like um the idea was that I should have just been grateful to have been there um and this was an, an institution in Miami where for a long time I was the only Latina on staff um and experienced different forms of you know um devaluation underpayment all of these things and I think um just being sort of finally, you know, get to that point where you're finally like, forget it, <laughs> I'm out of here. And, and, you know, I often say that, like women on the rise will probably be the most rewarding form of labor I ever do, right? I don't think anything will ever replace what it was like to be in a collective like that and work and do the work that we were doing in the community. The fact that we were able to even get paid to do that work is just crazy, right? And I think there was something about that that was threatening to the institution too. I remember folks um, at the museum like complaining when we would have our, our meetings because we were loud <laughs> or because like, you know, um, it just seemed like we were having fun. And that was read as like disrespectful or like not doing work, even though we were generating so much value, both in terms of funding and sort of social goodwill for the museum, right? So I think I came to a place of um, just wanting to to tell the story because I've been I've been robbed so many times, you know, like I said, the museum copywriting the program, then this whole thing happening with ICA. So like you come to realize that you cannot be connected to your to what you produce. And that's so colonial. Like think about chattel slavery and, and black women not being able to be connected to their children, right? Think about indigenous genocide. Like think about all the ways um, in both embodied ways and cultural ways that colonized people um, have had to divorce themselves from like what they produce, right? And so I think like once I understood that that was the condition and that there was really nothing to lose in telling the story. And like, there's been several stories about my book in Miami and none of them have taken up this question of the institutional critique that's the epilogue. And you know, whatever, I, I wrote it down and like, I do that for myself, right? Like honestly, at the end of the day, um, it's my own way I think of, of coping with, with the trauma from all of it. Thank you so much for the um, sort of address. I find it really enlightening. Um, so we have a couple of questions from Olivia Kutsky, Kutska. I, I apologize, Olivia, if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Uh, the first one she's asking, um, did you expect the response to Latina woman and the body? That sounded really bad, especially for a scene calling itself feminist. Oh yeah, it was a dean, a, a D E A N. Um, but yeah, I mean, same. Still, still a mess. Uh, no, not at all. Like in Miami, there are images of women in much skimpier bathing suits, like all over town. So honestly, that was like totally out of left field because there was really nothing in the image. Like at no, you know, how sometimes you do something and you're like, ooh, like something might be weird you know like someone might respond like I never had that feeling like I was I was truly um blindsided by it like completely um and it was super overwhelming but um it also like led me to understand more how like the sort of um politics and processes of aesthetics of excess actually work so in some ways it was kind of a gift because it it lended more credibility to to the work I was already doing in a sense of like oh yeah actually this is how this works right and here is this example um 
So um, yeah, that I did not expect that. And then your other question. And then, it? yeah. Oh, sorry, you can read them too. Um, but what is it like to make art that shows a variety of bodies? And are they always sexualized, sexualized that way? I'm not sure what, I'm not really sure what the sexualized part of your question means. I'm sorry, I don't know if you can elaborate a little bit more. If you can elaborate more, I'd be happy to, to answer. We can offer a few seconds for Olivia to bounce back at us. Um, yeah, I find it really interesting to think about the material in relation to trauma. And I wondered, um, I know in some of your writing, you know, you take a more kind of poetic approach and in other moments you do a more theoretical uh, breakdown. But um, I wondered in terms of like current research or how you come to view or consider artwork for the book, um, was it always artists you personally worked with? Um, well, like in, in Aesthetics of Excess, you mean? Um, in Aesthetics of Excess, it was more um, artists that arose through like our praxis, right? Like the artists that we were um, talking about with the girls really became really interesting. But then there were artists who I never anticipated writing about, like Nicki Minaj, and I have a whole chapter on Nicki Minaj, and that emerged from the girls' own interest and conversation. Um, and this was before I even knew I was writing a book. So it was really like a lot of it was, a lot of the book is me sort of like thinking retrospectively about women on the rise as a space and like how um, it was a sort of performative space where the aesthetics of excess sort of were um, in circulation playing out and being valued very differently or like um, being created, you know, in real time. So for me, uh, I often, you know, I, I write a lot too about like um, my friends, you know, and artists who are my friends. And I used, I used to sort of um, feel a little bit anxious about that because, you know, there's a way in which like you might not be taken as seriously, but again, like I'm, you know, it's like, what does it matter? You know, like, yeah. so, so especially in the art world where it's like so much of it is who you know, so much of it, you know, I remember, I remember this moment where I had proposed some kind of program to MoCA when I was working there. And the director said to me, well, you don't have a following, so no, you know, it was like, it, it was just this, like so many times, you know, where it's like, well, because no one is paying attention to what you're doing, like it doesn't matter, right? Um, and I think, you know, my friend Nereida Garcia Ferraz, who, who um, the long-term women on the rise instructor and a and brilliant artist once said to me, you know, like the margins is like the dope place, you know, like don't, don't feel bad about being in the margins, you know, um, the margins is where so much um, happens, where so much is created, right? And so um, I just think in, in many ways, you know, it's not through any kind of like, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, like political stance or whatever that I've sort of decided to disregard a lot of these conventions. I think I've been forced to, <laughs> like, I truly feel like I have been forced to, like, probably if everyone gave me like a green light to do all the things I wanted to do, I wouldn't arrive at these, at these moments, right? But I think many of us um, are just sort of, um, you know, our backs are put against the wall and, and you just, if you have any respect for yourself, Thank then this is what you, you end up doing, I think. Well, I find that, you know, what's fascinating about the slogan even is that it is a performative for like the way that sort of, you know, when you're at the margins, you're forced to find power in your vulnerability. Precisely mm -hmm. that what makes you other. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so Olivia has kind of expanded and clarified on her question. And I think what she meant was that the audience uh, had been offended by the pictures and oh. claiming that they were too sexual uh -huh. or like that, you know, somehow cellulite would be. Um, Offensive. Uh, you know, with the D. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, I mean, again, like that particular image of Crystal and her mom, I never read as a sexual image um, to begin with. So I think there's also something really interesting in how um, sexuality, like the, the sort of um, the sort of colonial ways that visuality operates often confers sexuality onto things that actually are not concerned with sexuality so like you know crystal's piece is about thinking about her mom you know what i mean like it's not about anything sexual and i mean and there is something there as far as like yes her mom was a um the debt performer in cuba who definitely sort of used her sexuality in her performance so i'm not going to discount that that's there but it's not sexual in this sort of imagined you know like heteronormative way and even if it was like, what would be the problem, right? But I think like that is through sort of um, discourses of sexuality that respectability politics tend to creep in. Like that's almost like the, the back door or the front door often actually of like where folks' respectability politics decide to appear, right? And I think that's why increasingly in my work, I find myself gravitated towards um cultural forms and cultural workers excuse me as i rip my eyelashes off and cultural workers who um who embrace sexuality who embrace racialized sexuality because there's an understanding um there's an understanding that there is a power there right um so i hope that answers your question thank you again for um your question Thank you so much, Jillian. And if anybody else has other questions, please uh, feed them to us via the YouTube. Um, you know, one thing that's interesting to me too, in terms of the book and its success, um, is maybe thinking about any projects that you might have had to abort or that didn't make it um, along your kind of like pedagogy and uh, academic life, and how perhaps you know. Sometimes it has to do like in one that you spoke about with the institution canceling them on you. Uh, because they're like perceived to be offensive or, you know, and how you deal with that um, cancellation that wasn't, you know, your choice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I continue to organize things anyway. Like, so I don't know. I think also, um, I'm trying to remember, it might have been a talk by Renee Cox where she said something like, you know, you never ask for permission. Like, like she she was just saying she would rather apologize than ask for permission like you apologize later right and I think I finally just also got to that point and I think that sometimes like I'm always sort of low-key like wondering like you know when my next whatever will be canceled or viewed as problematic just because I'm someone you know connected to an institution I'm a professor at an institution and I'm in a state right now I'm in Florida and right now they just passed a bill that like um allows students to like not ask professors permission to record right so like this is all under our guise of like you know conservative students feeling that they're being discriminated against in the academy yada 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 right so now it's like I'm supposed to feel like more afraid I guess that like people are gonna out me for being like una loca but um you know whatever i'm i'm very um i'm very open with my students um and i feel like that openness is is a an approach that i take in all of my different forms of work whether it be like curating whether it be um community arts work and it makes me open to a lot of exploitation um, but it also, I think, protects me in some ways too, because um, I am able to establish um, strong relationships with people. And I think especially over the pandemic, like understanding like that, um, and this is also something from, from my discussions with Kenya Robinson too, that like relationships are everything, like really, really at the end of the day. Um, and that's just helped me just, you know, I just have to have that center in myself um, and with folks around me that like, I have to feel somehow that um, 
I can get through or be protected in whatever way from these kinds of dynamics, right? And being okay with things canceling or whatever, or knowing that this thing might be canceled, but I'm sure I'm going to figure out like another way to do it anyway. You're like thinking on your feet in a way. It's interesting to think about that in relation to the notion of high maintenance. And, you know, so oftentimes with, with academic positions, like your career advancement is based on how much you publish or, you know, what kind of like stuff you're getting up to. And if that is constantly um, being butted in by the system in sort of discriminatory or, you know, opposing conflicting ways, it makes it really hard to be uh, academic of color in the world. Um, so I, I wonder if you have any... I wonder if you have any words of encouragement for, you know, those of us hoping to kind of fall in that life. Yeah. Um, but Oh, no, please finish. I'm sorry. Oh, are you working? Uh, finished? No, um, I, I guess I was finished. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted. That's like, honestly, I have hit like the biggest wall of exhaustion. And I think like it's because I'm, you know, my tenure file it's submitted, my book is out. And I think there's a way in which like, um, I'm starting to grapple with like the exhaustion, like the, the intense, like I'm a mother, like all these things, breadwinner for my family, like. And so it is very exhausting. And I have seen how both the art world and the academy have like depleted life from my friends and myself. So honestly, and this sounds so neoliberal, <laughs> but I am more interested lately, and this is part of high maintenance too, in, and, and I wish there was a better word, but this is a word we have in entrepreneurship. Like, I wish we had a better word, y'all. I'm sorry if I sound like a freaking neoliberal. The embrace of YouTube. Capitalist. And... Yo, I'm serious. You know, I'm serious. Like, like, please keep an eye on my channel because I have plans for it, right? I really do. And so it's like, how do we, and this was also from the pandemic, like these institutions are not checking for anybody, right? Like they will leave us all behind. <laughs> and so I think this idea of like, um, how we can create our own systems of value, like there's so much value just between us that even if we just circulate what we have among each other, you know, like mutual aid that folks have been doing in the U.S. for centuries, right, marginalized folks, like, we can survive and thrive this way. So I really am turning in my own mind um, away from waiting for this institution or that institution to care about my work or my well-being and figuring out ways um, to possibly do it myself because the exhaustion is the same, like, the work is the same, you know, um, so that's where I'm at with with that for sure is like figure thanks. out how to make your own bag please do. That's, um, thanks so much that's really kind of good to hear um, about embracing entrepreneurship but also not giving up the fight um, so we have a, another question from Hazel Katz I love this question so I'm, gonna, I'm excited to read it I feel that institutions often want work that's about pain or vulnerability uh, about marginalized people. How do you make and share work without giving them too much of what's precious of yourself? That's a beautiful question. Thank you so much, um, Hazel. I think I think that the way to do that is like, that's why I shared the Rococo Salon because that was not about, you know, like I didn't reveal anything about myself and no one had to unless they wanted to, right? And actually... Um, I was dressed in the epitome of fakery, right? I was sort of inspired by these women of the Rococo who would like put their makeup on in public. I was embracing Nicki Minaj, who everyone thinks is like a fake and a sellout and problematic, right? So to me, I think we combat what you're talking about because what, what you're describing is so right. I think a lot of these institutions, when they, they do want to include you, they want you to like, you know, they want to consume your pain. They want to consume your otherness, right? Um, and not even pay you enough to put on the show, right? So I think that um, celebration, and this is like, I'm so inspired by my friend and colleague, Ruth Nicole Brown and her work on black girlhood and celebration. It's like to insist on celebration, to insist on, connection to insist that like you are so much more 
than whatever these, you know, colonial categories might decide that you are or try to make you believe that you are. Um, I think that's how we do it. And I think that's why I'm so in, um, inspired by the work of like um, curator Christiana and Akimba Boyle, who was in that conversation and, and the show that she just curated that's like very much inspired by like hip hop groups like City Girls, like these ways in which like, I feel like in popular culture, right, women of color have always been at the vanguard of generating value and visibility through joy and pleasure, even as that itself, that popular culture sphere also inflicts violence. Um, there is nevertheless always an insistence on sort of self-determination and joy. Um, and, and I think that's why I'm always gravitating to popular culture because I think like popular culture for all of its problems is a place in which that can sort of unfold like I'm so inspired by like my boo bad bunny here I'm so inspired by Lil Nas X and the Montero video is just like brilliant um and powerful you know and accessible in ways that high art is not right so um I ran but popular culture and insistence the rants are essential like, please keep ranting sorry <laughs> no it's good it's good thank you insistence on on that joy and, and celebration and not necessarily having to give of yourself you know I think like Yvette Mayorga Pamela Council those artists Kenya Robinson like they're not doing that like they're not they're not sort of like here is my you know bleeding soul like they're actually through the feminine aesthetics in their work like putting a number and doing a number on the ism, you know, in, in the most like femme, low key, selfie of ways. And that is what I'm so um, compelled by right now. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question from Alexis Hythe. And thank you, Alexis, for posing a question. And thank you, Hazel. Um, I know this is kind of the midpoint in our quarter, so everybody's feeling the burnout. And, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> so Alexis is asking, just noticing that you did the uh, RQC with Gracie. Oh my God, I love her. We went to UCSD undergrad together, small yeah. world. On that note, I would love to hear your thoughts on balancing relationships with the work. Oh, that's so beautiful. Um, Gracie Uriarte, like, oh my God, like meeting Gracie was a light when I was in San Diego, because I was so far from all my family and friends, and she was one of my students in a Latinx sexualities class in my first spring semester, and like, I just love her too. Um, so it's difficult, you know, like I mentioned, like balancing those relationships. I'm that kind of person that for a while, I felt like, oh no, like we can totally work together and be friends and like you know, it won't be a problem. <clears throat> but um, no, you know, like I mentioned, um, with Women on the Rise, with the ICA split, um, I, you know, I'm, we're, we're friends again now, but I had a super rough patch with one of my friends who went to ICA, right, to do this work. And I felt like all of this betrayal, it was like a breakup, like I cried and cried and cried, you know, um, and so, and, and, and this has happened with, um, students that I end up working with, not Gracie, but other students where power dynamics, seniority, um, they do end up impacting. I think I was sort of naive and thinking that like, oh, you know, like all these professional norms are so like capitalist and, um, you know, we can just be ourselves and we can but boundaries are so important and I've had to learn how to respect other people's boundaries and I've had to learn how to assert my own boundary um and so and being super transparent about power dynamics um and that's also something and just being accountable and learning and it's difficult like to learn like and be like oh like I messed that up I shouldn't have put you in that situation you know um but no it's not always happy happy joy joy like there have been like really really difficult um moments um in relationships through doing collaborative work absolutely for sure great thank you so much for um 
everything you've shared with us today. I really look forward to my studio visit with you. And I'm sure the MFAs uh, who you, you've already met with are also really thankful. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I think maybe we could just conclude here. But thank you so much to it. Oh, one more. Um, it's coming. <laughs> I know this format is so odd. It's so broken. But it's yeah, working. It's, it's, it's working. It's, uh, yeah, we can all try to make the best with with what it is. Um, is wait. this it again? So Alexis is saying. I mean, Gracie is a sunflower, so I'm cool with that coming up twice because she is. I just didn't know if that's the question or. I don't know how to cut my copy and paste is broken. Can you do, can you read it? Can folks hear you? Okay. It keeps on pacing the same thing. Um, so Alexis, did, did you already answer this? Um, are there times, perhaps especially now, that you feel the work knots up relationships or that the relationship is more important than the work so you take your time with the work? Oh, yeah. I think I addressed that, yeah. Okay, Let's sorry. See. No, no, no. We're good. Yeah. Well, we've come to, we're five minutes beyond. So, um, thank you, thank everyone, you so Jillian, for visiting us. Thank you, uh, Fabiola. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, thank you. Your labor in the Q and A, and for all our guests, uh, we're gonna say goodbye now. So, everyone, please give Jillian some love on the YouTube, and she'll visit it later and see all your comments in real time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cho. Sending you love. Thank you.